Hi folks, welcome back to the Fly From Home channel. It's Jimbo here this time and I am going to be giving you a review on this gorgeous Just Flight BAE 146 in front of us here and uh, as a bonus as well, based on the route that you're going to see shortly, we're also going to have a look at Lanzarote Airport which has also been provided by Just Flight. Um, as you might have imagined, first of all, it's a uh, big credit to our friends at Just Flight. They've provided us with review copies of both of these. So thank you very much, guys, for um, sending these over. And uh, apologies for the delay it's taken to get this review out, but it's actually given me a lot of time to play around with this aircraft. And to be completely honest with you, I am having the best time flying this little thing around. It's a great little aircraft. Um, and it's got a lot of little quirks and features that you may not find on the uh, bigger aircraft that are more commonly used um, in flight sim. So what's so special about the 146? It's a, uh, it's a small regional turbofan aircraft. Um, as you can see, it's kind of an unusual configuration in that it's got four engines. And for those of you who aren't familiar with this aircraft, um, it's kind of unusual to have it on a regional jet, and there was a couple of reasons that they did it. First of all, um, they fitted four engines to make it a lot quieter on takeoff. Uh, seemingly, four smaller engines compared to two larger turbofan engines, much quieter at full chat, and uh, therefore can get in and out of airports quite quietly. Um, there's also a redundancy aspect to it, so the having the four engines, you're only going to lose probably a bit more than 25% of your net thrust because you're going to add, add a bit of drag from kicking it over with a rudder, keeping it straight, that kind of thing, but it's nowhere near as much as, you know, 55-60% loss when you lose one of two engines on a normal two-engine aircraft. It's worth pointing out at this point that there's a lot of um, comments that are made about this aircraft uh, with regards to these four engines and you might have noticed they are quite diddy. Um, a lot of people describe it as an aircraft with five APUs um, or four hair dryers and it's possibly kind of speaking the truth a little bit because they're not the most powerful engines and although one of the reasons this aircraft exists is for its good STOL or short takeoff and landing capability as you'll see shortly, when you're at a hot airport, doesn't really have a good takeoff distance. Just going to put that out there. Landing distance, on the other hand, is phenomenal. You've got huge carbon brakes and this massive air brake that we'll show you shortly that deploys out of the tail um, and it can really slow down quite quickly after landing. But in terms of takeoff performance, it's kind of mediocre. Um, and while I've got it in front of me and I'm thinking about it, the 100, 200 and 300 actually all have the same engines. Now this is the three different models of the 146 that you're going to find in this pack. There's a couple of other ones and I'll go through them shortly as well. The 100 is going to be the lightest with about a 38 tonne takeoff weight. Um, the 200 has got a 42 tonne, just over 42 tonnes, and then finally the 300 has got a 44.3 tonne max takeoff weight. Now, the range of seats obviously varies, so the smallest was 70. I haven't got the exact figure on the 200, but it's about halfway between uh, 70 and 112, 112 being the 300 series. Now, because they've got the same engines, this is where it gets a bit strange. Uh, the official data that we've got in the add-on, and there is some wonderful documentation and manuals that comes with this aircraft from Just Flight, the official documentation says that the 100 can take off to 35 feet in 1,106 metres. I'm saying that in metres, that's the best unit for me. You guys convert it to feet if you uh, really hate using metres. Um, 200, it says it takes off in 1,509 metres to 35 feet. And then bizarrely the 300 series, which is a whole two tonnes heavier, still does it in 1,509 metres can't say I've really noticed that the 300 is the same takeoff distance as the 200 and nor can I figure out why but um, needless to say if you want the best performance you're going to look at the 100 because they all have the same engines and they're just stretching them each time. Um, the engines across the board are Lycoming based ALF 502s which um, they have about 6,970 pounds of thrust each. And unfortunately, because of the the way the engines are laid out and the power that they produce, 
first of all, one unusual quirk of this aircraft is you should really take off with the bleeds off, so you're not draining any power in that sense. And also, they don't actually all have the same ancillary equipment. So two of the engines have hydraulic pumps, while the other two have electrical generators. So they're not actually equipped with both each, again, probably to maximize the power output of each engine. So, I mean, you'd be very unlucky, but if you had two engines fail that were both running the hydraulic systems, which are the inner two engines, then you're all out of hydraulics. Um, but you'd have to be really out of luck to lose both the inner engines. The aircraft also has a maximum ceiling of 30,000 feet. And about that level, you're expecting about 295 knots indicated, which takes uh, takes you up to about 383 knots true airspeed, which is no slouch by any means, and it makes it quite a nippy little regional aircraft. But with the way the engines are, it does take a while to climb to altitude, and it does take some time to get up to your cruising speed. But otherwise, as I say, I've been having a lot of fun with this little machine, and uh, it. it does have uh, some quite nice flying characteristics that make it, um, I would say, more along the lines of a, a, a manual flying aircraft, one that you would want to use less automation on uh, and just get the most out of it. With that being said, it does come equipped with, you know, a fully fledged autopilot, um, an FMS that's capable of flying LNAV. More on that later, though, because it is quite a basic FMS um, and I'm not too sure that it's actually um, accurate to this particular aircraft. Also very quickly, I'd just like to make a shout out to one of our community members on our Discord. Richard Dastardly has been helping me figure out this aircraft, work on some checklists together and uh, just contribute massively to my understanding which is going towards this video. So massive shout to you, thanks for all your help there Rich. So here's what you're actually getting um, in this add-on. You're getting, as mentioned before, the 1, the 2 and the 300 series, but there's also a couple of subsets within each. Um, and just to clear up anyone who's not too sure, you've got the 146-100cc2 here, which is a military variant uh, that the RAF used for, um, for various missions, uh, still with passenger seats on it, um, but yeah, otherwise a military variant. And within that, you've actually got two RAF liveries um, associated with it. Uh, then you've probably noticed that you've got something called a QC on the 200 series. Uh, the QC is a uh, convertible type, so you can actually adapt it to either uh, passenger entirely or freight or a mix of the two. Um, and then that brings me on to the QT. Um, presumably the Q here, we were talking about quiet because they were really, uh, really big on the fact that it was quite quiet. Uh, the T stands for trader, so you've got a quiet trader here which is just your full freight variant and you've got quite a few liveries within each of them. Uh, then under the 300 again you've got another QT uh, series as well. I haven't counted the exact number but unlike the uh, PMDG 737 we reviewed before all of the liveries are installed as default when you install the aircraft so uh, I haven't counted exactly how many that is but you've got a good selection and not to mention anyone who's familiar with flightsim.to you can then go out and get um, a myriad of um, third-party um, liveries from that website and you might have noticed that I've actually picked up a Iberia Air Nostrum livery for the route that we're flying today. So here we are guys, it's sunny Lanzarote and as I mentioned before we have this beautiful airport add-on from Just Flight as well to uh, showcase you guys. Um, now quick spin around at Lanzarote Airport then. What we're getting with this add-on is the entire airport has been done over with uh, high definition textures everywhere as you can see. We've then got some new animated jetways um, which look fantastic and they behave as the standard jetways do in Microsoft Flight Sim. Uh, we've then also got a visual docking guidance system which is fully functioning. You can use it just by pulling up to the stand. Um, in the example I've got here I've just uh, got ATC to taxi me to a gate and it comes on automatically. Uh, even tells you if you're going too fast as you can see from my Ryanair arrival here. We've then got animated palm trees. We've got uh, flags moving in the wind. We have a fully model terminal interior here with passengers wandering around and you can even see the departure signs. I mean they're obviously not animated but they still look pretty cool. 
and the 2D textures on the shops, but you know, it's that little extra detail that we didn't expect. And if you have a look over here at this Binter aircraft, there's also some passengers kicking off at the steps of an aircraft. Looks like Karen at the front isn't uh, fully accepting of the mask policy on board the aircraft, so this is definitely a very up-to-date add-on here. Um, unfortunately, they never resolve anything. I've sat here and watched them for about three hours and they just carry on arguing. So it's not completely true to life. I think the Spanish would have probably had her put in prison by now. And all of this is available on the Just Flight site for £13.49. So um, it's a very worthy addition to your uh, airport portfolio um, for visiting various airports in the Canary Islands. Right then, back to the aircraft. So one thing I didn't mention before is you can pick up a copy of this 146 from Just Flight for £49.99. and pence. Now, in all honesty, you know my opinion of some slightly more expensive add-ons that you can currently get for Flight Sim, and for £49.99, and you'll hopefully see this as we go through this video, you get a lot for your money on this aircraft. Um, the only thing really to first point out is, much like some slightly more expensive add-ons, the uh, circuit breakers are not clickable, so it's it's not 100% study level yet. If you notice on the upper overhead panel, you've got all these ground test buttons for your first flight of the day. Now I'm not going to go through them today, but they all function as expected, so you can do all of your pre-flight checks on every single system. Uh, before departure and it all works. That's just brought me on to another good point as well. You also have a horn for the ground so you can honk at people. I mean this aircraft is fully featured. So let's have a quick look at the exterior then. Um, certainly can't complain about the quality of the textures here. The mirror finish on the fuselage is fantastic. Um, we've got, in terms of the wheel wells, you don't have the greatest detail on the, land, the nose landing gear. Uh, you can see sort of lower polygon textures there, um, but all of the bits hanging off, all of the stickers, um, you can see, a f for the most part, looking at this one, it's not completely visible, but um, a lot of them are relatively good quality on the outside of the aircraft. Uh, cargo areas, it's sort of a flat texture in there, you've got the netting there as you can see and uh, the main landing gear much like the nose, slightly lower quality but um, otherwise detailed enough for those great shots and you've got some great camera angles to really play with them as well um, from inside the cabin and underneath the belly of the aircraft that you can have a look at. Engine wise, uh, I mean you've got a lovely shiny leading edge on each of the engines there, tiny little APUs look, um, and the leading edge, fantastic detail, you can see the, it's, it's not the best quality but you've got the landing light there in a, in a clear recess inside the uh, leading edge of the wing, um, controls look great, you've got the flattened rivets all the way around here which look quite detailed. I don't think they're 3D but they don't look half bad. Lots of movement on the flap as you might imagine for an aircraft that needs to have short takeoff and landing capability. It, um, it certainly throws the barn doors out when you need them. And moving to the back, we've got a nicely modelled rear galley there. Look, We'll have a quick peek in here and see the, um, see the cabin. Uh, Alright, it's not the most amazing detail in the cabin but it'll do. What have we got in the back galley? Again, sort of flat textures, but yeah, not too bad, not too bad. Could be a little bit higher resolution, I don't think there's any, any plans to improve that just yet. The door looks pretty detailed. Um, some of the writing is a little bit illegible, but otherwise it's good. APU-wise, it's a bit of a funny arrangement because the whole rear of the, um, the aircraft is taken up by this huge air brake here at the back, so the APU sort of intake and exhaust pokes out the sides instead. 
um, so this whole rear part is uh, is left secure. As you can see there's a bit of a gap there, now that's actually quite a good bit of detail because when the aircraft is powered down there's no hydraulic pressure and this thing can, if it's got a wind right up behind it, it can start to get blown open, just sit in the open position until you get the engines going or you apply uh, a DC or AC hydraulic pump and then it will bring up the hydraulic pressure and close again. So in this position it's depowered, you can see it's just just sitting slightly open as a result. Nice bit of detail there. High, high T-tail at the back. Now one of the unusual characteristics of this aircraft is um, the control surfaces are run by what's called servo tabs. So this very small area at the back here is actually what's controlled from the flight deck. Now it needs hydraulics so much as expected it's not working right now. I am moving my controls. Same with the ailerons, nothing there. But what you expect to happen once we've got the hydraulic pressure up is just the a uh, tiny tab at the back is the one that moves. Moving around the other side, much as really the right hand side. I love the reflections on this, really detailed, even with this uh, this extra livery that I've downloaded um, just to get kind of historically accurate on this route that we're doing today. And how's the front galley look? Front galley is the same as the back, really. You've got two cabin jump seats there. Uh, sorry, two cabin crew seats there. Not awful, not amazing, but you know we're not we're not paying for a detailed cabin. So back into the flight deck then. Um, as you can see, this is much more manual mode than a lot of the newer airliners that we're uh, treated to in flight sim. So this one's got a lot of analog gauges instead and uh, even to the level of detail you do have some reflections on the glass of each of these instruments which is brilliant. A um, couple of things, let me get the yoke out of the way so you can see um, the yoke is just hidden by this uh, pedal adjuster button uh, lever over here, you can hide it there and while I'm down there as well you can actually hide the EFB as well by clicking this one. You've got two FMSs here. Now, um, as I mentioned before, those FMSs aren't actually, uh, as far as I know, the ones that you would expect in this kind of aircraft. They are taken from the working title, um, CJ4. Uh, they're just a Rockwell Collins FMS that you can find in, in that add-on. I believe there is talk of them adding a, a more accurate version of it, but they've said at the moment that this kind of meets the requirement to have some sort of LNAV equipped aircraft uh, capability. Now in all fairness on today's flight I'm very much not going to be using that because all it really allows us to do is as I say fly LNAV and uh, the real fun in this aircraft comes from doing as much of it as manually as possible which is probably a good time for me to talk to you about the route that we're doing today. So we're going to depart from Lanzarote. Uh, this as I say, beautiful add-on airport here, so you'll see some of the taxiways as we taxi around for departure. Um, on takeoff from Lanzarote we're going to follow a manual SID um, which is going to make use of our VORs and distances to make the turn. So the first part of the departure is going to be the Laris 1 mic departure. That takes us down to a waypoint called Laris which then conveniently links up with the Laris 1 Victor arrival into La Palma, which is where we're headed to today. Once we've completed the arrival into La Palma, what we're going to do is we're going to do the manual NDB DME runway 36. You're going to make me work for this today, guys. Um, into, as I say, runway 36. Uh, so we'll do all of that manually using our various radio navigation aids. Now as I've mentioned I'm not going to do any of this in the FMS, this is going to be all flown manually. So as well as a departure profile which is quite complex on this aircraft, certainly with your power management and while I'm talking about that, um, again like we've talked about with previous aircraft, I should probably put this in red flashing text, there are no auto throttles on this aircraft. Very much manual power control. Now there are some very manual aspects on this one, you will need to manage the power properly and you've got something here called uh, the thrust modulation system and it will help you 
It's not an auto throttle per se, but it will help you by almost providing you with a detent that you can apply various power settings. So you can see here we've got a takeoff mode, we've got max continuous th mode, we've got target exhaust gas temperature or turbine gas temperature, sorry, mode, um, and you've also got a descent mode which will maintain the uh, required power at its lowest setting so that you've still got various bleed air sources working. Um, and then you've also got a sync which allows you to synchronize from any selected engine, usually default number one, uh, to basically match the power settings on the other three engines which is quite useful. And we'll have a look at those as we go through the flight. Your guidance panel is up here and as I mentioned before we're going to be making heavy use of the VOR mode here which is uh, V slash L so VOR or localizer mode and uh, we'll be doing that in either heading with vertical modes for climbing uh, either IAS or pitch for what I'm used to. Um, I understand that some vertical modes are recommended um, in the climb for vertical speed but I'm not used to doing that very often and I'd prefer to use IAS or pitch just for the extra safety factor really. So you've got your usual analogue pack of instruments here, hopefully you recognise them all. Two altimeters, uh, currently it's a digital screen and it's switched off but your VSI would appear in here. And then you've got your uh, HSI in the middle with various sources and uh, also a relative magnetic indicator on the left hand side to give you some uh, direct twos uh, or froms based on what you've tuned and you've got your uh, nav radios are actually up on the glare shield panel next to the uh, flight guidance control panel. Detail wise um, the, the modelling in the cockpit is definitely much better um, than certain aspects of the interior towards the back as you'd expect you're going to be spending most of your time in here. Um, the jump seat doesn't pull out which is a big shame but it's there, it's modelled, the textures look like they're out of the 80s which is um, perfectly suited. And yeah, lots of buttons, way more than you'd expect on most aircraft. Your overhead panel is heavily populated and we'll go through the various SOPs to operate this. Um, speaking of which, I have followed the instructions provided by Just Flight. They've got a very extensive manual on how to operate the aircraft and a good selection of YouTube videos to help you learn how to operate it. So using those, I've, I've based that around what, how I'm going to operate the aircraft today. So um, you can also use that documentation to help familiarise yourself with how to operate it. EFB wise we've got this little tablet here I showed you how to show and hide it with the uh, compass card uh, down there just to click and hide it um, it's alright there's some sort of clunky aspects to it so for example you, you can access your charts um, using your Navigraph subscription um, which is good but it's, it's not the best because you, you search it up here and if I can get the IKO right meant to put GCRR even, so for those people who are offended by me putting LF, which I think is France, um, you can then pull up your plates for that airport, but it, it won't save anything, it won't save what plate you're looking at, so it's not quite as feature rich as um, looking at it on your own tablet, for instance, with the Navigraph app, but it's a good little pointer, and as you can see, you've got your aircraft here as well, which, um, which is handy. For, for a moving map aspect. Of course that's cheating so I won't be using that for the departure um, today and we can also look at the departure on here to, um, to help familiarise us with it. So it's a runway 03 out of Lanzarote and you can see the routing there. It's all um, radio navigation, it's, it's not um, an RNAV departure so we can do it all without the FMS which is great. You've just got a simple moving map on this tab um, which yeah is alright, it doesn't show you the route or anything that you're flying but you can roughly get the idea, it just sort of is a, is a relief map or something like that with various city names and that overlaid onto it. Another good feature of this is you can load up your flight plan from Simbrief. So here is the flight plan. As you can see uh, we're cruising at 27,000 feet, we need just over 5 tonnes of fuel and I'm going to try and tie in the, the weight with what we've got in the flight plan here because it does take a while to get to 27,000 feet and we might actually be trying to do the star by the time we get to that cruising altitude. So I'll match the weights on here and perfect test for today, the average ISA is plus 18 degrees, it's hot, 
so we're going to get that very um, thin air which is going to cause problems with departing out of Lanzarote and just the whole flight in general. You can also view the output for the routing on here which is useful if you're programming the FMS uh, got to grab the scroll wheel here rather you can see the route here mine's quite straightforward uh, straight from the SID via Laris to the star um, from 03 to 36 at um, La Palma the aircraft settings page I don't know why it, it has a, s a second page to it it's kind of annoying you, you go to this page and then you have to click another button to open it um, oh that's handy that's that's in the latest update as well you can just straight away put the fuel payload um, and the gross weight to match what we've got on our sim brief so it's set the payload for the passengers the cargo and the fuel to what we need there you go you can see we've got five tons there one thing worth noting on this page as well because it's not very clearly documented if you click the C of G here it actually moves your trim position um, to the takeoff position but of course uh, we'll do that when everything's up and running so that we can actually um, make sure it has set it properly you've also got control for all the doors uh, your chocks and ground power on this page as well and to get out of this page you just have to hit the home up there and it'll take you back um, notes wise if you want to add some notes um, sure exactly what you'd want to put in there but it's useful you've got the settings page which allows you to put your sim brief login in change the brightness don't know what the theme does oh blue theme oh okay quite cool 24 hour clock and that's about it uh, just going back to the aircraft page to change some settings on the aircraft you can do it here there's not a lot there though um, Make sure you've got the flip chart options enabled, and that allows you to uh, easily plug in your takeoff performance speeds or landing speeds just by clicking the flip chart in the middle of the um, instrument panel. I'm not sure what any of these others do, but I've just left them all at default. Rudder axis steering works perfectly for me, so I am going to stick with that. Um, before I continue, there's two things actually that are worth noting. Um, and I, I would highly recommend that you try and close this. There we go. And let's go to the operational flight plan, plan page. There we go. Uh, worth thinking about before you start getting your teeth into this aircraft, and that is some button maps. Now, there is a feature on this aircraft, the uh, autopilot, as you might al already have noticed, or you might have flown it and you've realised, doesn't have a pitch control wheel. So normally you'd use the pitch wheel to say adjust your IAS for a climb or a vertical speed or pitch, whatever mode it's in you just roll that wheel up and down and it would change it. Now this aircraft doesn't have it, what it has instead is uh, if you can see it on the yoke, yeah you can see the arrow to it uh, pointing right, I think it's on the outside of the yoke here, something called sync. Now, uh, what Sync does is essentially allows you to leave the autopilot engaged and adjust your pitch attitude to a new setting. Now, obviously, depending on what you've actually got enabled, uh, it will change how it how it works slightly. Once you've got it to the new datum that you want, you basically turn off the Sync mode and the autopilot will then maintain that. So if you've got a given vertical speed and you need to change it, you press Sync you uh, just move the pitch control, you, you will have full control at this point so you will need to make sure you're following your lateral guidance as well. Adjust your pitch to whatever vertical speed you want. I, I've just got a toggle so then uh, I press the sync button again and it will then turn off sync and it will maintain what it's been left at. Obviously for the IAS it's a bit different because what you'll need to do for the IAS is maintain a pitch in sync mode until you've accelerated to the speed that you want and then turn off sync mode. Now to enable this you need to use the toggle afterburner function in the key bindings on flight sim. So set up a button on that and that will make your life a lot easier. One of the other ones that is a little bit complicated is the autopilot master switch that is down here. Now if you're uh, halfway through a SID and you're just adjusting your vertical profile to start cleaning up, to accelerate, whatever it's the worst possible time and it's usually about 2,000 feet you do this to enable the autopilot so I've just made sure that I've got an autopilot master key bound to my joystick it's a bit annoying because it would be nice to actually sort of press the realistic button that's associated with it but because it's all the way down here that is just not happening um, unless you've got a friend to do it for you 
binder keys just to your autopilot master so that you can quickly enable the autopilot when you get to your 2000 foot AGL. Okay, so without further ado, let's get this thing going. So I'm going to start by putting the batteries on, which are up here, and cue the 1940s till sound. You can hear all the gyros starting up, although the instruments are still flagged at the moment. What we'll do is we'll get the APU running now as well so that we're not draining the batteries too much. You can see that from here. Um, you've got the uh, voltage here and it's not showing any amps there. So let's start the APU anyway. We need the left inner pump on for the APU to be working properly so I would have suggested you put that on first. See if we can hear it. Yeah, it's starting up, and you can actually see the, the heats out of the exhaust there on the right hand side of the fuselage. Fantastic. Once it gets into operational range, let's put the APU gen on. Here we go. Now everything's going to start working. Okay, so let's now we've got some power to the aircraft, let's start following the checklist. Okay, so landing gear is down, weather radar is off and 15 degrees up. Unfortunately the weather radar does not work. There is a ground mapping function on it, but uh, much like it seems all the add-ons for flight sim at the moment, it doesn't actually show you any weather, which is disappointing. Um, as has been mentioned on all the other add-ons I think we've got in flight sim at the moment but allegedly it's a Microsoft problem and hopefully they're sorting it soon. Uh, transponder to standby, that's already on standby, air brake and flaps. So the air brake is here, it's in, flaps are up. No smoking signs on. Uh, unfortunately, as is a lot of quirks on this aircraft, some of the lighting is down here and then some of the other ones, including the fastened seatbelt sign, is down there. And the other ones are right up here. So here's no smoking. Don't really want that one on. Okay. And the nav lights are even uh, up here as well, so we want them at high intensity. So that's this side. Batteries 1 and 2 are both on already. Uh, parking brake is set to yellow and park. So we can check that the parking brake is on on the enunciators here and it should be set to yellow so if you can see here the brake lever here is pointed to the yellow system you can actually assign it to the green system as well. So master switch is all on now you can also use the the normal function here to see them um, although it doesn't seem to show me here but there are a lot of master switches which might be white. All the way up here you've got your damper, autopilot and your avionics which will get the instruments going now. Uh, ground ignition as required, so your ground ignition is down here, I think. Oh, oh yep, yeah, sorry, it's on both. Yep, yeah, fine. Uh, normal is both. I think you can start on A or B. They're your ignition channels, so you can see if all the igniters are working in a, in a given engine. Uh, Anti-skid then, let's switch that on. This spoiler's yellow and green to on. AC and DC bus tie to auto. It's further down here. Okay. Switches make a great noise. Sounds like you're actually there. Standby inverter and generator to arm. There we go. Generators one and four both off. So as I mentioned before, you've got your hydraulics are on the inner engines and the generators are on the outer engines. So uh, generator one for the furthest to the left engine, generator four is on the right hand side uh, furthest out as well. They're both off slash reset. Galley shed switch to galley. APU generator is on, I've done that and uh, the left inner pump for the APU is on. Engine fire handles are all in. Yep. Ground test, I'm not going to do that but you can see all the ground tests are up here and as mentioned they all function. APU started, APU is stable, APU air and packs on. Yeah, let's get the cabin cooled down, it's quite hot uh, in Lanzarote at the moment. So the APU air is there, pack one, pack two, they're both on. 
Landing gear indicators should be three greens. And let's just take a moment to take in the fact that noises have now increased as the air is flowing. Excellent detail there. And you've probably noticed I've got my friend here to help me throughout the flight as well. I'll say hi to him. MWS. Now, I can't remember what the MWS is, but let's find it. Oh, the master warning system. Okay, that would make sense. Uh, tested a norm. Push to test. Yep. Looks right to me. Just hide that again. Overhead enunciators tested a norm. So you can test the enunciators using. I don't know where the test switch is. But it will uh, it'll put them all on. I uh, can't remember. No, can't remember. Anyway. It's just to make sure all the lights are working anyway. Cabin emergency lights to arm. Uh, they are up here. That's in the arm position. Ground test. Yep, not going to bother with that, but it's all there if you wanted to. DC pump on. Yellow brake pressure rise. Checked. And then off. So will this do what it's supposed to do? So DC pump on. Yellow brake pressure is up. You can see it just here. And then if I turn it off... Will it go back down? Eh. I guess it might rise by a little bit or it's not fully modelled. Uh, AC pump and PTU again on, check pressure and then turn it off again. So on and PTU on. There we go, up they come. So the PTU transfers power to the green system through the yellow. So if the yellow is pressurised, the power transfer unit will then transfer that to the green as well. Thereby you only need one pump and one transfer. Back to off and off. Let's just see if the DC pump does anything. No, seemingly not. I'm not sure what's going on there. Unless we need to run it on battery, which you can't. Okay, flight deck emergency lights, they're down here of course, because why wouldn't they be? To arm. Your damper's both on. Your damper master is on. Uh, I think it's referring to the switch down here. Uh, yeah, your damper 1 and 2 is on. Oxygen mask and oxygen main valve, which is off to the left. Not sure where that is actually. I think that just drops the oxygen out. Okay, so that's complete. Let's have a look at the before start. Okay, now we've got power. Let's just make sure that we're all set up to go and then we'll come back to the checklist. So I'm going to use this page here to make sure all my frequencies are tuned in. So the Laris 1 mic departure we're looking for. So let's go to the charts and there's the Laris 1 mic. And let's zoom in a little bit. So we're going to climb on LTE radial 038 to D4. So LTT is 1144 and we need a radial of 038. So let's get the radio on. So to do that, the nav radio is rather, you need to switch that to on and strangely push the on button. The one on the right hand side, it's not as obvious, but you've actually got uh, the, the switches on the end. Uh, and I have actually flown around with this thing switched off and wondered why it's not working. But if you just click there, that's on. And course it's clear that it's on now isn't it. So anyway uh, where were we? 14.4 and 0.38 so let's get the active frequency to 14.4 and the radial to 0.38 too far I'm going to match the left and right hand sides um, however, I'm going to use NAV2 to give me a DME for the other frequency, which is going to be our Lanzarote VOR at the top there. So once we uh, get to 4, we make a right turn and we then follow 049 radial, as you can see here, a little jink to the right. And we go out to 12 miles and we make a left turn up to the LZR to then go outbound on 261. So the LZR is 152, and I'm going to put that on the pre tune here. says okay, I'm doing that. Okay. 15 2 and I'm going to make it the active frequency on VHF 2 there we go 
Now we're not going to use ATC on here, so I'm just going to put in the departure SID altitude and then we'll f go from there. Yeah, so there's 90. And if I arm the flight directors, we're going to get pitch and roll function here. And I'm going to arm the altitude. And we'll put in a heading mode as well. There we go. So we'll be departing on runway heading. And in fact, I need to make sure I've got the runway heading set as well. Let's just check the taxi plate here so we can see what the runway direction is. It's this one, isn't it? There we go. So it is a little bit pixely there, 031. So we've got to line up that triangular heading bug there. 031. There we go. Okay, so the flight director bars are on the everything is tuned and just going back to our SID then this is, can't, keep trying to scroll the wrong way back to our SID we're all set up all the way to flight level 90 now I'm just going to flash the weather up in front now so we can see what we're playing with let me center up the camera again so the Q&H here at Lanzarote is 1014 since 1015, because that's the current weather. It seems to have adjusted both of those. Has it done the FO side? It has. So it looks like all of the Q&Hs are synced, at least in this add-on. I doubt it's that for uh, in real life. Um, this is all set up. I've got all these modes ready. We're all set. Like I say, I'm not, not going to touch this at all. I'm going to leave the FMS, because all it can really do is, is your flight plan and your departure and arrival, and a hold. Um, we're not going to do any holding, so we are just going to fly it using our radio navs. Uh, everything looks set up down here. We will definitely need this. So we'll need to set this to ADF. And we'll tune that in a bit closer because we're going to need that. Let's switch on the brake temperature monitor. Looks good. Just going to have a quick scan around, make sure I've got everything set. So far, so good. We'll finish off going through the checklist. Uh, there's a few things over here that might um, might be hard to notice that you've got them until you need them. Your steep approach button is there for when you're doing your uh, London City approaches. I think three and a half degrees, greater than three and a half degrees, you need to use the steep approach button for the GPWS. You also have a flap override button there as well if you're doing flapless for some crazy reason. Um, and then all of your engine gauges down the middle and your fuel gauge is at the bottom here as well. As you can see we've set two and a half tons per side. There is a centre tank as well but it's not used that frequently. Right, that's a relatively easy setup then so let's continue with the checklist. Before it starts then, so we've talked about the departure briefing, you know what I'm going to do on the way out. We've done the nav radios, comm radios I'm not interested in Brake pressure is above two and a half thousand. Yep. Uh, hydraulics are all off. Fuel centre transfer to auto. And the fuel side is up here, so let's just put that on auto. Ice detect on. That's under this guarded switch here. On. There we go. Fasten seatbelt signs. Let's get those on. Fuel quantity we've talked about, flight data recorder. Now this one's quite interesting, I'm not going to fiddle with it, but flight data recorder is over on the co-pilot side, and over here you actually have to set the day in the month, which is already set, and then the flight number. We're actually 001, so let's just do that. Um, and then you're basically setting the flight data recorder to record that parameter on this information so they can tie it back to your flight. I'm guessing if someone wanted to be naughty and try and hide it, they'd probably just mess up the numbers here and then they wouldn't know what day or month uh, or flight number it's associated with but uh, that's just a guess at this point. Okay, we've set the altimeters and we've got the master warning system ground operation switch in normal I think. Red light extinguished, yeah. Pull ground op, okay. Yeah, I think I think it's ground op. Yep, fine. Let's clear those again. TMS, N1 speeds and bugs. Okay, so uh, thrust modulation system, let's power that up. 
and we're going to go with flat 24. 24 is about the sweet spot for the takeoff uh, most places when you're worried about the shorter distance or anything like that. And we can set the bugs. So you've got your uh, V1 and rotate bugs are actually displayed on your ASI. And if we click, I'll try and get both of them in shot here. If we click flat 24, it should set them for you. There you go. And you've got the red and the white there. Uh, correspond to VFTO and VER. So VFTO is your final takeoff speed. VER is... I can't remember. I can't remember what VER is, but uh, it's not important for a, for a normal flight. It might be um, single engine ops. I know that's your V2, isn't it? Um, possibly minimum clean. You start cleaning up at 181, so perhaps v, uh, 191 is your minimum clean speed. Uh, we won't be going anywhere near that. So we've set that anyway, uh, let's start looking at closing and removing all equipment. So we'll do that on this page. I've also got a pushback tool that I've been using and a traffic add-on. So if you've not noticed already, we've got some other aircraft assets around. I've been using the uh, um, AIG AI manager tool to give us some live traffic just based on flight plan data, uh, just to make it look a little bit more truer to life which is great and let's start closing doors it's too slow for that and we can use the ground pushback tool to get rid of the baggage team And that I think all the other ground services are away. We've still got the chocks in and the park brake, if that's definitely engaged, let's get rid of the chocks. Yeah, park brake's on so chocks can go. Radio, let's finish the checklist then. So doors and equipment is closed and removed and now we need to go on to engine starting. So I'm going to start by planning our pushback first of all. So it's going to be runway 03. So let's go on to here. Okay, so we want to push back and we want to face to the left. So let's push back to here and let's turn the nose of the aircraft facing. A westerly position and stop there. I hit enter now, that's our plan sorted. So I can actually hear passengers talking, which is pretty impressive. I suppose I need to shut the door, that might help. Don't know who's talking. I'm going to shut the door. Here we go. Perfect. That one sounds just. Nope, they don't stop. Okay, fair enough. Uh, right, let's get the beacon on. Beacon's all the way up here, because why wouldn't it be? Beacon on. Packs and APU air all off. We need that off for engine start, so packs, APU air off. Lovely sound effects there. Engine anti-ice all four on. I'm not really sure why this is done, but I'll put them on anyway, possibly if you're starting in a cold place. Uh, fuel pumps all on. Uh, TMS goes off again. Okay, interesting. Power off. Right. Engine start power to normal. So that's on normal. And engine start master to on. Perfect. Right, we're ready to start now. So what I'm going to do... Uh, I'm not going to tick off each of these in turn, but basically when we get to N2, we uh, put the fuel on on the thrust lever and that's it, nice and easy and we've got the selector here so we're going to start with engine number four and let's get our push back now cockpit to ground this is ground, stand by oh, and the jetway is automatically left that was something I missed out but that's handy that it just does it by itself interesting movement it's got going there Okay, 
Okay, sir. And that's locked as well. Is installed. All doors and hatches closed and all ground equipment is removed. The parking brakes are set. You may lift. Parking brakes set. Up. Lifting the aircraft. We can see the beacon light. Yeah, you can see it underneath reflecting off the ground. We are cleared cool. for start and push. Okay, cleared for push start. Please release parking brake. Okay, I'm going to use my parking brakes are key released. For that. Commencing push back. You can start the engines in sequence. It will start in the sequence. There we go. Right, so we'll start with engine number four. Start master is on. Lots of noise. We're on engine four. So we're looking for 10% on the N2, wasn't it? There we go. We'd have to be able to see the start switch. There we go. We just run something over. Turn, which looks good. That looks like a stable start, so let's go on to engine three. Looking for ten percent again. Where is he off to? Okay, push back completed. Please set your parking brake. Parking brake set. Parking brake set. Lowering aircraft. Ground. You may disconnect. Okay, sir. Clear to disconnect. Super Pin light. has been removed. See you at the side. Have a good flight. Holding position waiting for the visual. Thank you and goodbye. process starting four engines though unfortunately. There's ten percent. You can see the fuel flow just, just tips up there when you uh, move the lever forward. Good. Right. 
So these are all started. Yeah, so we've done all of those things. Let's go straight to the after start. So start power back to normal. Yeah, it's still on normal. Uh, start selector and master. Both off. And the engine anti ice. No chance of needing those, so they can go off. Gen 1 and 4 both on. They're on. Brake fans to auto. Because of the huge brakes, we need extra cooling for them. Engine 1 and 3 hydraulic pumps to both on. On and on. There we go. AC pump and PTU auto and on. to have those on right now, but uh, APU air and packs on as is required, so it's quite hot outside, so let's get the packs and the APU air on. We're going to leave it like that on departure as well, so we don't actually use any bleed air on the engines, but we still have air conditioning in the aircraft as we take off with a running APU. Uh, engine air off as required, yeah, no, I'm leaving it off. TMS, right, let's get the TMS on and set to take off. T-Ref, it should be set to the outside air temperature, which is currently 28 degrees at Lanzarote, which is correct. Uh, we'll set takeoff mode there. And now we've got these little blue diamonds, which uh, blue triangles, which is going to be important for when we set our takeoff thrust. Uh, transponder, I'm just going to set that and forget about it now, so let's put it all the way around to TARA. That should set it up on the VSI there, as you can see. And taxi lights to on. Uh, go down for on and up for landing lights. And brakes test on initial roll. Excellent. Right, before we forget, let's uh, let's just click our flap 24 takeoff again. Make sure that the engine gauges are more or less set to where they should be. And let's set our takeoff flap of 24. As you can see, it auto trims there as well. Once it's finished doing that, what I'm going to do is just make sure that from the EFB it's correctly set to our takeoff CFG by clicking here. And I think it moved a little bit, but it seems to be set. Great. Okay, so taxi lights are on. The next one is before takeoff. So let's make our way down to the end of the runway. little whistle from these tiny little Lycoming engines. Let's just get the taxi play out as well. So we're taking off zero 03, so we're just going to make a left here off the apron, and then we're going to turn right down the taxiway. As I mentioned before, you've got those servo tabs, if you can see, moving at the back of the elevators. What's strange about this is I'm not sure if Flight Sim models it properly because it shouldn't actually move the main flying control um, at all until you've got some proper airflow over it. And I really don't think we've got proper airflow over it right now. Um, the ailerons are doing what they're supposed to. You can see the little balanced servo tab moving on the ailerons as well as a spoiler. And they're not actually moving, but the elevator seems to be a bit strange. are just flashing in and out there, excellent. Uh, lots of undulations on this um, add-on airport as well, so there's a little hump down here that you've got to be wary of as you as you taxi down. great voice um, effects on this add-on as well, so we'll get voices from the FO and the cabin crew at various stages of flight. Uh, speaking of which, we can chime the cabin, cabin crew, please take your seats for takeoff. and make sure that they are ready to go. Cabin, 
here. Excellent. Much like some of the other add-ons, you can hear it um, going over the bumps and undulations on the taxiway as well. I think you might be able to hear it hitting the centre line lights if we get it in the right spot. That's in the right spot to be going over a few of them. Yeah, there you go. You can hear it. Just this checklist to come. lights there. Some great detail on this add-on. The signs look fantastic as well. Just come a bit closer to the holding point and we'll stop there and get everything set up ready. That'll do. Stick the parking brake on. Right, so brakes are checked in yellow. We've got pressure there and so we can say that we tested them on taxi. Flaps are selected to 24 and indicating 24 up here. Uh, flight instruments we have checked, so we've got our runway heading set for departure. We're going to start in heading mode, and then as soon as we can, after about 300 feet, we're going to start an intercept turn onto that radial um, for the first part of the departure to four miles. So let's just drag that sit up here as well, so we can see where we're going. There we go. So the first part of the departure to four four miles should be held at 038, and then after four miles, we're going to intercept 049. Uh, all the way out to 12 miles. We should make those altitude restrictions fine. Uh, flight directors are on and as required and um, there, sh there might be a takeoff mode here but I've not actually found out how to set it so at the moment the pitch uh, bar is, is set at zero uh, which is kind of annoying but I don't know any other way around it. It might update itself as we uh, as we depart but there's no there's no to be a uh, takeoff or go around mode um, to set. Trims we've set, config, so we can test our config down here, I think, with the park brake on. Yeah. If I turn the park brake off, perfect. There we go. Continuous ignition A and B. Let's just put those on for safety. Yeah, perfect. Cabin is secured. We've had that weather radar. It doesn't really work, but I'll tell you what we'll do. We do have a ground mode on it, so let's put it on ground mode. Uh, sorry, map mode, and uh, you will actually see airports appear on here. That's the best you can do at the moment. Uh, landing and strobe lights, yeah, I'm not going to get much more time to do that, so let's swap these to landing lights. And the strobe lights are, of course, all the way up here. Uh, and we want any other end? Let's put logo lights on, everything else looks fine. That's done. TMS on and takeoff mode on. Takeoff mode is armed. Flight controls, you can see on the left hand side there. Unlocked and free. Master warning system. Yep, looks alright. I think. Yep, okay. Done something. Cool. And the next checklist is the after takeoff, so let's get rid of that for now. Let's get lined up. My rudder controls are a bit jumpy, so you might see me weaving down the runway. Nothing much I can do about that, unfortunately. Um, it doesn't actually happen uh, for real to me, it's just the issue I've got with my rudder pedals at the moment. I'm just twitching down the runway on a real aircraft, don't worry. I'm going to use all the runway because I think we might need it. It's a hot day. Okay. And let's just quickly talk about the departure then. Um, I'm going to follow a profile again that's been shared on one of the Just Flight training videos for this aircraft. So we're going to climb um, basically with the takeoff power set on the TMS 
and we're going to be flying at V2 plus 10. So in our case today, V2 plus 10 is going to be 137 knots. So that's going to be our initial climb speed all the way up to 1500 feet. When we get to 1500 feet, we'll lower the nose slightly. Uh, we'll use the sync function that I mentioned to you before, and just so that you can see it on here, I think we can do it now. Uh, when you press, you'll see a white sync appear there, and as I say, for me, it's a toggle, so I then press it again to turn it off. Um, we're going to then change the engine power to using a, a graph, basically, around 88%. Now, it's a bit hotter here, and there is a lot of complexity to the N1 power setting you need for various temperatures. There's a lot more management of the engines here, but I'm just going to hang my hat on an 88% figure, and every 5,000 feet we're just going to push it up by an extra 1%, so when we get to 5,000 foot AGL we'll go to 89% uh, and so on. Uh, we'll also then accelerate up to our V-flap retraction speed, which is 181. Once we pass that, we can set flap 0. Um, now we will get rid of flap 24 before then, uh, the flap 24 max speed is 180 anyway, so we would be clear to, to um, just approach 181 before doing it, but by the time we get to about 160, 170, I'll be losing flap 24, and then we'll wait for uh, VFTO to, lose flap, uh, to go back to flap 0. Once we've cleaned up, we'll aim for 210 indicated airspeed, so I'll be accelerating up to that using the IAS, sorry, using the sync mode, and the aircraft will be in IAS mode and then we get to 2,000 feet. We'll engage the autopilot. As I mentioned to you before, uh, I'm not going to do it by pressing the button down there. It's too awkward. Um, let's just put IFR code in there. I'm not doing VFR. There we go, that's better. Um, and then uh, 2,000 feet, we will carry on climbing at 210, up to 10,000, at which point we will accelerate to 250 for the rest of the climb. Cruising altitude is 27,000 feet as per our uh, OFP here, flight level 270, and it should be a flight time of about 40 minutes uh, between the two. There's going to be a lot of other things on the way as well. Once we um, are starting to accelerate at 88%, I will like to uh, lose the APU bleed air and then swap over to the engine bleeds, and then we can actually get rid of the APU for the rest of the climb. Um, and at some point, I'm going to try and fit in the after takeoff checks. That's about it for the departure brief. Uh, we've talked about the, the SID itself, so I think without further ado, uh, let's get cracking. Okay, so we're just going to um, hold the brakes to about 55% and then we'll let go, we'll, uh, sorry, increase the power to uh, our takeoff N1, which is going to be these yellow triangles, um, and then the TMS should take over and adjust them accordingly um, from that point onwards. Uh, so. I'm going to release the parking brake, I'm going to hold it on the brakes and let's get it up to about 55%, make sure everything's stable. TMS sets takeoff. All looks good. As you can hear, he's confirming that's all set for takeoff. So let's advance to the yellow. That's close enough, and we'll release the brakes and we'll hope the curvature of the Earth gets us airborne. Power set, and achieved. Speed alive, both sides. 80 knots cross checked. Whenever you're ready. V1. Rotate. And I'm going to enable the RAS mode because we're about V2 plus 10 now. And there's 300 feet, so let's get that intercept going. I've armed the VLR mode, so I'm just following the flight directors as best I can. V2 
1500, AGL will be about uh, 1650, because Lanzarote is quite low elevation. V2 plus 10. Let's go for sync, uh, let's start accelerating and let's lose that first stage of flap, We're going back to uh, 15 degrees flat now. And we need to accelerate up to our next speed, which is going to be 181. And our next point will be 4 miles for the intercept onto 049, which is coming up. Just turn my heading a little bit that way. There we go. Okay. Flat zero. Still in sync mode at the moment, there's 4 miles. And we need 4.9 now. I'm going to get the autopilot in in a second, but I tell you what, let's get to 2.10 first. Just make sure I can read my airspeed alright. There's 2.10, sync mode off, and let's engage the autopilot. Notice. Let's get the power back to 88% now, and we'll do that in sync mode. So whatever I set on engine number one, as you can see here, will be mirrored on all the other engines. Excellent. Next distance is going to be 12 miles. So let's do the after takeoff checks. Uh, landing gear is up and lights are out. Flaps are indicating zero. TMS is set to sync. Let's get the engine air all on. Uh, APU air off. And packs should both be on and pressurising. And before I forget, let's set our cruising altitude as well. Something I missed there. I'll just swing across a bit. Should be set to 27,000 feet. And the inner window that says flight altitude, like so. Packs are both on, and let's just check that we are pressurising down here. We've got a rate of climb, and the pressure's going up. Perfect. How are we doing? 11 miles. Excellent. So I'm just going to align the heading bug for the next part, which is going to be that turn towards Lanzarote. Let's get some charts again. Coming up on 12 miles. There we go. Let's start the left turn in heading mode. We've got our um, direction to the VOR is about 310 based on our RMI. So let's go for 310 there. And we need an inbound course 261. Or an outbound course of 261, but we'll get it whenever we can. 261, and we need to be on that frequency. There we go. We'll just preemptively arm the VOR mode now. We're above um, our transition level now, so let's set standard pressure and let's go up to our cruising altitude now of 27. Make sure you arm every time. Go. Just lessen that heading a little bit. Set. One zero one three set on those two. What about that side? Yeah, it's set on that side. It should actually be two nine nine two. There we go. There we go. Marvelous. Uh, we've probably climbed another five thousand feet, so let's go up to eighty nine percent. If my throttles are that sensitive. Yeah, close enough. There we go. Nope. Don't think my throttles have got that level of sensitivity. It's going to maintain a heading now, I think, by the looks of things. So I think because we're now over the cone of confusion, it's probably going to 
just need a little bit of encouragement to get on to 261. Let's update the number two site now as well. Okay, and make sure that VOR mode is definitely in. VOR mode's back in, excellent. That is 10,000 feet, so let's lose the landing lights and we'll get rid of the APU now as well. And let's do our climb checks before I forget. So we set the altimeters to 1013, PTU and AC pump go off now. APU is off, fasten seat belts, yeah, we'll let them out. Let's let's try a cabin call first to oh, take seats for landing, okay, that's not what I wanted. And uh, lights are done. So seat belt signs are off now as well. Line our heading bug. Just hit a bird. Let's push up our power levers a little bit more as well. Yeah, get to 90, and that's about right for this level. And as we mentioned, we're at 210 now, but we can actually accelerate to 250, so I'm going to push the sync button. And I'm going to lower the nose a bit, try and keep it in a climb uh, whilst doing so, but let it accelerate up to um, 250. Here we go. It's, all, it's sort of climbing. It's, it's flying a bit level, but as soon as we get to the speed, we can then um, disengage the sync mode and let it reacquire. This is the problem with sync mode when you're talking about IAS because I'm hand flying it at this point just to get it up to you know the next speed that we need and once it's at that desired speed then we can let the autopilot do it for us again but until that point we're hand flying. Nearly there. Five degrees, sorry, two and a half degrees pitch seems to work. There's 250, sync mode off. Let the autopilot do it all again once it wobbles around a bit. Don't think there's any other checklist to do. Uh, descent checks next, next, so not for a while. The climb rate's not awful, um, it is still quite warm, so I mean, even at this sort of level, we're not even below zero yet, and you know, we're at 13,000 feet, so it's, it's quite a bit above ISA, um, which is going to hinder the climb rate. Laris is quite uh, quite some way away, so we're not even halfway down there to uh, to the next waypoint yet. 71.8 miles we're waiting for. As I mentioned before, in this hot weather, it is going to take quite some time to get to cruising altitude. Possibly even when we need to uh, arrive on the star. But um, thanks to our giant air brake. Which you could probably call the hand of God at this point. Um, 
it's like it is like throwing an anchor out and we'll be able to descend pretty rapidly um, so all this progress we've made in the climb we can lose quite quickly um, but more on that when we start the actual arrival at the other end the next frequency we're going to need will be the Tenerife North VOR which is 117.7 so I'm just going to pre-tune that as well and let's um, Let's in fact get this side ready on it as well. Cool. Interesting. We've got ice detected. We're running out a little bit of a layer of cloud, so let's get the uh, anti-ice on, and we'll put the engine anti-ice on as well to make sure that's protected. Continuous ignition is still on, so that protects any sort of possible flameouts, perhaps. That will probably uh, take away some of our massive amounts of power, but you know, we need it on. We've got ice detected. Still looks like we're tracking slightly north of track, um, but as you can see everything is set as per the published um, courses, uh, it should, should marry up. It's sort of a good um, true to life thing really, because it's never going to be 100% accurate when you're following VORs. It's, it is obviously really accurate, but um, certainly there's a little bit of, of leeway there. down to the instrument itself on the aircraft. Not sure what it's doing here. Uh, let's see if we can get away with the anti-ice going off. It behaves a bit strangely in that while the anti-ice is on it, it sort of the logic is that you the ice detect disappears and then if you turn it off again it will reappear. Um, if it's anything like the dash, the ice detect probe should just detect whether or not there's ice regardless of what you're doing with the ice protection systems. But um, yeah, we'll leave the engine valves open for now, but it looks like we're not in icing conditions. There's our cabin altitude. Really you know, the diff okay, so I think I see what happened is happening here. That cabin altitude is staying at about seven and the differential pressure is just slowly creeping up. It sort of reached its cabin altitude before the aircraft has reached its physical altitude. As you can see on the TMS as well, just, just to reiterate, as we're in sync mode, it's using number one engine as the master there, so you can actually change it, I believe, by just pressing master and then reselecting a new engine. And the, the function is of N1. You can change it between N1 and N2 if you want, um, and obviously change the master engine. But the default is to use N1 as the controlling function and, uh, and synchronize by means of engine 1. And that's what we're doing at the moment. We'll let it accelerate up to uh, about 300 knots. Now, speed control is quite difficult in this, uh, as you might imagine, because you are manually controlling the speed. So it'll probably s take some time to accelerate up as well. Um, and while we're doing that, we'll have a quick look at uh, some of the handling aspects of this aircraft. And most notably, seeing how the air brake performs, because, as I mentioned before, it's, it's almost like the hand of God is just slowing you down reaching down and pulling on the back of your aircraft. Seems to be in out capture mode now, you can see the modes changed up here. So now we should be slowly accelerating up to our cruising speed. It's about 37 miles to run to Tenerife North. 
Then we've got another track change, it's going to go on to West 270, um, and then we're going to go outbound by 63 miles to reach Araco, um, which is then going to be the start of our NDB approach into La Palma. Um, I'm going to need to set up some beacons for that in a moment, and uh, also talk about the descent planning. Start uh, reducing the power now just to ensure that we don't bust our uh, maximum speed of about 295 there. Now what you can do to maintain a speed which might give you another level of accuracy is to use the uh, turbine gas temperature, or sorry, total gas temperature to, um, to manage your power setting. So essentially if you enable this mode then you've got your wheels down here and if I just change this to 800 what it will do is try and target all four engines to 800 TGT and then you can fine tune it a lot better. Obviously if you retard your actual physical power levers below a certain point then your con control is back in your hands, you're no longer in what you could call sort of a racing detent and, um, and they're no longer maintaining it for you. But we'll see what 800 does and then if we need to, if it's still accelerating, we'll drop it back to 750. Um, in fact, that does feel a bit high, to be honest. I'm going to start doing that now. 750. It's dropped out because it was such a big change, so I'm just going to bring it back in. There we go. And now it should maintain about 750. So we've got a um, indicated airspeed of 280, ground speed of 430, which is lovely. Um, and let's start setting up for the arrival. And before I do that, let's jump to a bit of a handling exercise now. So um, what I want to do is show you how effective the air brake is and also do a couple of steep, steep turns just to um, show off the handling, the hand flying of this aircraft. I think it's quite a nice aircraft to fly and well balanced. Okay, here we go. So I'll disconnect the autopilot now. And I'm going to start with uh, some steep turns up to 45 degree banks. So I'm just swinging it round to 45 degrees in a right turn. We'll come round to 180 degrees and then we'll turn back. It doesn't seem to have much back pressure required to maintain our altitude, so that might be a little bit off there. But otherwise it's, it's quite responsive. It's a nice aircraft in terms of hand flying it. Um, I'm just holding the altitude here with flight level 270 and uh, yeah, just keeping the back pressure there. But like I say, it, it's not as much as I was expect. Bank angle, bank angle. That seems to be a bit late coming in as well, because normally it starts to sing after about 35, 40 degrees on the aircraft I'm used to, but perhaps it's actually over 45 in this machine. Um, yeah, still not a lot of back pressure there. Uh, again, I'm used to a T-tail as well in, in what I do, and we've done steep turns in the sim, so this does feel a little bit low. Um, we're going to switch back in a second and we'll try going back the other way and yeah, it's, I'm letting off a bit of back pressure now so there is there is a bit there but it just doesn't feel like it's enough and it's responsive, it's got quite a nice roll rate all the way through to the other side back to 45 Bang degrees, Bang well, it came on straight away there um, and then just yeah, maintaining 270 and we'll come back on to our original heading um, appreciate I've got it in VOR mode at the moment, we'll just level off that original heading and, and go from there. The next thing we want to look at is the uh, power pitch couple and speed brakes. So, yeah, I mean this is, this is quite easy just to hold it here while I'm talking and it just doesn't really, it's quite benign, it doesn't seem to really climb, descend or anything. This is one of the best parts of it. It's, it's certainly a fun little aircraft. I'm just not too sure about the the level of elevator pressure you need to hold it in this steep turn. Okay, coming up on my heading now, so I'm just going to start rolling back to wings level. Right, there we go. Right. Okay. Uh, let's try the next one. Um, so what I'm just going to do is I'm, I'm just going to reduce the power to idle uh, with it in trim and just see if it starts to nose down or if there's a lot um, swap it to heading mode actually see if there's a lot of um, 
pitch change, um, like we talked about with some previous aircraft with underslung engines. I wouldn't expect this to have a huge change in pitch, only relating to the loss of power and the trim wanting to maintain the airspeed. So I'm just holding it for a mo, and then I'm just going to let it do what it wants with this low power setting. It's starting to descend, the nose hasn't come down a lot. This feels quite realistic to be honest. Um, let's try it the other way. Just make sure I don't exceed my limits. Bit slower to pitch back up, which is which is basically what you'd expect. That's a lot of aircraft handle like this. I'm just helping it a little bit. Yeah, I mean that that looks pretty realistic to me. Good work so far on the uh, flight model for sure. Uh, let's try whacking that air brake out and see what happens. So what I'm going to do here is just to see how long it takes us to go from about 280 knots down to our minimum clean, which is about 190 in this current weight. So pass wider first and then we'll throw out the air brake. You won't see me doing this because I've just got it bound to a button. Uh, it's losing speed fairly rapidly. One of the things that I've read about this aircraft is um, it is actually quite easy to maintain something crazy like 250 knots to a 4 mile final and the air brake will then bring you into a stable configuration for your 1500 foot checks which is just balmy. And I mean you can see it here, we, we've lost, in the time I'm talking, we've lost 80 odd knots, I'm just coming down to 190 now so start accelerating again. But yeah, I'm pretty impressed with all that. I think the air brake is a hell of a bit of kit as well. Okay, back onto this flight then. Right. Let's set up for the approach. So we're going to do none of this fancy stuff. We're going to do the NDB. Here we go. So we need 389 is La Palma. Go and 12.4 is the DME. Set them both up on each side. And 389 for the ADF, which is always causing me problems because each of these wheels does each one. Oh no, it's working so far. Oh, no, missed one. Right. Oh, there we go. Right, let's try it. Three, eight, nine. Perfect. And what I'll do is I'll flick this over to ADF so we've got that. It might not actually see it at this point. Uh, how are we doing for the VOR? We're almost overhead now, actually, aren't we? Uh, in fact, we need this one as the VOR for now because we have detuned the other one. There we go. Not in range of the ADF yet. They are both in ADF mode, yeah, they are. Okay, that's fine. So, the platform is four and a half um, at Araco, all the way around to 60ME Bravo Victor, which is our 112.4, and then we're going to come down to 3.4 to continue the approach. Now, uh, what I want to show you is, first of all, on this arrival, our normal descent profile, and what I would consider doing on most flights, is to work out about a three degree descent. So to do that, I usually take our altitude, multiply it by three, and take off a few zeros. So if we're at flight level 270, I'd be expecting to descend at uh, so 2754, about 71 miles from our, um, you know, our designated point. Uh, that's from 270 of course, we've got that platform at 4.5, so let's call it 23, so it would be 60, 69 miles to start the descent. I'm not going to do that, I'm going to do it at um, about 35 miles, about half that, just to demonstrate how effective this air brake is. Um, and 
yeah, you'll see shortly. So 39 miles, uh, shortly we're going to change to 270. Let's put it back into heading mode and let's set the course to 270. Hopefully that will... Here we go. Can we arm that? No, because we're overhead and there's no DME. Okay. Let's just maintain a heading of west for now. We just fly over the TFN. All right. Showing we're slightly left a bit. Hopefully that's enough to arm it again. There we go. Right, 270 outbound. So when this gets to about 30 miles, I'm going to descend down to our uh, platform of four and a half thousand feet. So I'm going to get that ready now. I'm not going to arm it. Don't worry, it's wobbling around, it is doing something. The autopilot is a little bit janky. I wonder if it uses the standard model of the autopilot from Flight Sim. Okay. I don't know if we can set the standby altimeter on our QNH or if that's going to mess up things. So it's 1016 at the partner. No, it's going to let us. 016, so we can just set the other, the main one over when we uh, when we start getting towards our transition altitude, uh, transition level even. Uh, so yeah, it's the winds from the north still, 25 degrees, nice and warm. Going back to this arrival then, um, we've also, as you've probably noticed, we've got a lovely DMA arc to fly. So uh, we've got the RMI giving us some needles to use as guidance. So when we get to 18 BV, uh, which annoyingly is, oh no, sorry, it's, it's off the Palmer. So I've also already got that on DME2. Uh, let me just confirm that, 12.4, yep. When that reads 18, um, and of course it's going to align with our TFN 270 inbound as well, although the distance isn't published here, we'll read it off the, the arrival plate. We'll turn very briefly onto 307, and then 18 miles we will, um, so this, as you can see, 19, there's one mile difference. We'll then start a left turn so that we're putting that ADF needle 90 degrees off our wing to the right. And then we're just going to maintain a 16 DME arc within hopefully plus or minus a mile. It's usually better to be inside the arc. Um, and then just making 20 degree adjustments to sit somewhere around you know, the 15 to 17 mile mark um, until we get to that 342 line there. And then we start our final NDB turn inbound onto 350. The wind is slightly from the left, so I'm expecting, uh, sorry, from the right, so I'm expecting possibly about five degree correction on 350 to maintain it. How are we doing for distance? So 10 more miles, and then we'll try this air brake descent and see how much of a difference it makes. It's still actually getting us down quite early because although I'm aiming for that four and a half thousand foot at Araco, we're maintaining four and a half all the way to the um, inbound course, and it's only then that we start descending down to three four. But um, I'm just going to use that as an aiming point, really, so we've got an idea of the mileage. So when we get to thirty, remember, we're going to going to push the nose down. It's a bit pixelated there. There we go, thirty. Just sort of puts us overhead diesel. I'm going to do the descent in IAS mode, so we're just going to keep our 280 knot speed. Strictly speaking, of course, we should be slowing down to 250 or less at flight level 100, but let's just call it an experiment. There's no one really to annoy here. Okay, so power to idle. Set IAS. Let's make sure altitude is armed. And let's throw the air brake out. Watch it go. Dive, dive, dive. So hopefully we reach that altitude at uh, si no greater than 63 miles because that's going to be a racco and then we need to think about other things. Uh, 
Now you can start the APU below 25,000 feet, so I'll get a little bit lower and then what we're going to do is we're going to shed the um, bleeds and transfer it over to the APU again so that we've got excess power if we need it for a go around. Again, these poor little engines can't handle running the bleed air and take off or go around thrust at the same time. We're on the peg at 6,000 feet per minute. Um, maybe we'll try timing to see actually what our rate of descent is. In fact, we were probably at about uh, 195 when we when the seconds was at zero. So let's see where we're at when it reaches uh, when it comes all the way around again. What it should actually be doing as well is having this in descent mode so that it maintains the right schedule for uh, bleed air and uh, various other functions from the engine. Um, so it's not running too low a thrust essentially. Looking good to make that point. We've still got 20 miles and we've only got to lose 10,000 feet now. And that's a minute and it's at let's say 13,000. So we've, we're doing about 6,500 feet per minute then. fuel saving descent there. We're going to get through it quite quickly so let's get the landing lights on at 10,000 feet and uh, let's fire up the APU. Okay, that's coming on. Warning about the, uh, sorry, caution about the APU coming on which is fine. Let's set our standard pressure now for all our altimeters. Set across there as well. Gonna lose the engine bleeds now. Uh, sorry, engine anti-ice. APU's available. Bleed air is going on. Yep. And let's lose the engine bleeds. Perfect. <laughs> Get the sink rate. Let's take the air brake out now to give it a chance to sort itself out. And there you go. Still got 13 miles to run, and we're just levelling off now. So we managed that in about 20 miles. Let the speed bleed off now to about 210. Uh, let's make sure we're set for our speeds on the approach. So if I hit that one, I should set it. So VREF should be 121. Is that what's been set? Yep. Great. I'm going to come right back on the speed now to help me on this arrival. So just to reiterate on that arrival, it's 63 miles should bring us to Araco. So we've got nine miles to run. We should start actually appearing on here in a second. Have we got any checklist items that we need to do? There we go, that's showing on there. Descent checks then. PTU have to go on. I think this should be an auto as well, so we'll just do that. And pressurization probably should be set for ground level now, to be honest. But shouldn't matter too much. In fact, let's just wind it back to elevation at the airfield. There we go. Briefing's complete, landing data's checked. Okay. Right, we're ready to take over with heading. We're coming back to 220 knots now. Just going to bleed a bit more speed off as well. Throw the air brake out again. That's good. Nice and easy to bleed a bit of speed off, isn't it? And let's start applying a bit of thrust just to maintain about 200 knots. Should be fine. Yeah, that'll be fine. Minimum speeds for flap as well, guys. Uh, it's quite hard to find this, but uh, sorry, maximum speeds 210 for flap 18, uh, 180 for flaps 24, 170 for 30, and 145 for flaps 33. So. Those are the speed limits I'm going to be following uh, on the way down. 
63, are we there yet? Nearly. And then we need to go to 307 on the heading. over now, let's tune the DME and we're looking for 18.0 to start the turn. Just going to drop below 200 and get the first stage of flap out. There's 18, so now we're going to swing it round and put the ADF on our right wing which is going to be uh, about 200. should be fine for now. Remember that DME arc we're looking for is about uh, 16 miles so just coming into it now I might actually turn it a little bit to the right in fact because it looks like we're counting outside of it now. Let's go up to 210 and I should cover it. Don't really want to be on the outside of it in fact. Gonna go flat 24 now, we below 180. Yeah. Still counting up, so we're on the wrong side of it at the moment. Let's throw another 20 degrees in. Two four should do it actually looking at my needle there. Bit more power. set our inbound course so that we've got something to hang our hat on as well as 350 is inbound. Okay. okay that's counting down which is good so we'll keep on this heading for a bit and that turn is for 342 inbound we're looking for. Let's get these to line up now. There we go. The APU is running, the landing lights are on, the seatbelt should be on, shouldn't they? Let's get the next part of it ready, so 3-4 is the next bit. I won't arm it because that disengages the, the mode if I do. 3-3-5 is the course, we're still looking for 3-4-2. We get to 342, we're going to set a heading of about 355. It's probably about 340 there. Looking good to me, so let's start that turn onto 355. Throw the gear down. Go with flat 30. Arm the altitude and we'll just come down in IAS mode. Inbound course 350 then, so we're at 345 at the moment, so we just need to increase it slightly. So let's go back the other way slightly. a bit more on that actually guys. So remember for an NDB what you want to do is push the needle away from you so if you need the 
uh, the head of the needle to move to the right, you want to be left of it. Obviously wind corrected, so we might need a bit more than that, but we'll see. Eight point five is our top of a descent point, and with our approach speed of one twenty one, we're looking at probably about six hundred feet per minute. So I'm going to need to do that as a sync function as well. So that's pushing it to three five zero now. A couple of degrees off, and we'll start turning in. Get some power, so we don't slow down too much. Altimeters are set, fossil seatbelts set, APUs on, brake fans are auto, fuel panel set, cabins warned. Oh, come on. Steep approach not required, rad out, we can't set that for this minima, anti ice is done. AC pumps on auto, landing gears down three greens, lights are on, flap set for landing, not quite, let's stop there. How's that inbound? There we go. Just try setting it to exactly 350 for now and see if that covers it. Eight and a half we're looking for. Attach on the slow side there. Let's we'll get the last stage of flap out now anyway. What going on? Okay, flap 33 is set. We're ready to go over the top now. Let's reduce the load on the speed, a bit more power there. One of the things we'll need to do as well is to kick off the speed brake um, after landing as well. Okay, so airframe anti and de-ice is off. Yep, confirmed. APU air and packs is on and required. Engine air is off. Nose wheel steering centered. Right, that's good. All those checks are done. Let's clear that. Well, I don't think it does prepare seats for landing more than once. So eight miles. Let's uh, let's engage VS mode for now. And we'll just uh, hit the sync button, and we're looking for 600 feet per minute, guys. Okay, that's eight and a half. A bit of fine tuning here to get 600 feet per minute. Once we get there, that's it. And do the sync button. That should keep us going in. It's a bit easier doing it this way. Um, we're slightly on the wrong side of track, so let's just correct that slightly. Still not quite there on the right. Okay, let's try that. Oh, where's it going? Nobody knows. So we can see the runway ahead there, it's a huge offset as you might imagine, um, so we're going to be straightening the nose when we get close to it. At 7 miles we should be 28.90, so we just touch on the high side, and that rate is sort of a bit lagging behind, so let's let's go for a slightly higher rate, out there. Possibly just slightly more to the right to push that nose round, the head of the needle rather. Six miles should be 25.40. It's a bit on the high side. We're at 800 feet per minute though. It should it should come back in slowly. Let's just chuck a little bit more on there. Okay. 2,500. Uh, right out's coming alive. The minima is 3.2 or uh, an altitude of 1,600. So we need to bear that in mind, but we are visual, so um, I can't see that being an issue. Five miles, we're looking at 2200. Not too bad. At four miles, we'll maybe come back to that rate of 600 feet per minute then, guys. degree correction for that inbound course, it looks like we've brought it around in the correct sense. And four miles. 
a little bit on the low side now, so let's sink it back up to uh, about 500 feet per minute, perhaps. As you can see, you really need that sync button. It's a bit of a godsend. In fact, I can see two whites and two reds, so it's looking good. Just going to correct a couple of degrees to the right by the looks of things. On the slow side. a little bit low now actually. Let's just reduce that rate a touch. Again a bit slow on the speed there. To break that out. Yeah. That's looking good. Well we should get rid of the autopilot now, We're going in manually. Let's get rid of the flight director entirely because I don't want to use it at all now, I'm visual. Just make sure I can see my VSI there, there we go. So we've got full flat, we've got gear down, we're going into three whites which we don't want. Speed's creeping up, so of course we've got the wonderful air brake that we can use whenever we feel like it. Five hundred. Just aligning with the centre line now. There we go. That's the. Got rid of the air brake now. Centre line's good. Three reds is fine. Just maintain that now. To idle. 20, 20, 10, 10. Those come down. Get those brakes out. See if we can make the first exit. 80 knots. Not quite. Well, we might do. Swing it around now. We'll probably get a quick, quick backtrack, and we'll be off. Just do our off the land checks. Go with the strobe lights. So after landing, air brakes and spoilers are now in, flaps are up, lights and strobes taxiing off. Oh flight directors I turned off previously. TMS can go off. TMS is off with a radar. Off, that's already at 15 degrees. Transponder, we'll leave that until we're on stand. Engine anti ice is already off. Continuous ignition to go off. Cool. On to the shutdowns next. Let's get ourselves a uh, air traffic derived gate. La Palma Ground AIR and OSTRUM 110 taxi to the gate.
So we're off to gate six. Gate six. Wonder if we've got the brakes warm after all that. Yeah, they're at 350 degrees. Look, that's impressive. Right, gate six. Got a marshaller. Yeah, we have. I've actually got another add-on for this airfield, but uh, we've not. Um, we're not planning to review this one just yet. It's uh, it's my own add-on. Straight, he says. Taxi lights should be off. Yeah, they are. Where's your stick gun, mate? My right, part brake should be on. Yep, it is. Let's do the shutdown checks. Taxi lights off, pressurisation is depressurised. All the hydraulics going off. Yep, that's all off. Gen 1 and 4 both off for reset. Have we got the APU gen on? Yeah, we have. Yep, thrust levers to fuel off. Started at the other end. Okay, they're all off. MWS ground up, pulled to ground up. There we go. Pass the seat belts off. Brake fans. How oh, hot the brakes. Still quite warm, let's leave them there. Fuel pumps off except left inner for the APU. There we go. Heaters all off. Ice detect off. Okay. okay. Beacon light can now go off. Transponder to standby. See, that's when we'd normally do it. There we go. Doors and equipment open as acquired. Alright, well, let's do that, shall we? Let's go onto this page and open the forward packs and possibly get some cargo going. Put the chocks in. If I open my pushback tool here, I think we can get a jetway, in fact. Oh no, we can't. In that case, let's push the stairs out, shall we? Even makes a rattle when it hits the ground. Excellent. Well, Marshall's not done a very good job. Okay, fair enough. I hope you've enjoyed this flight with us, guys. Um, this is a fantastic piece of kit, and before I even start my pros and cons, I'd like to say that I think this is a worthy uh, aircraft for anyone's hangar, to be quite honest with you. It's, it's a great manual aircraft. There's a lot more work involved in flying it, but it is, it is fantastic fun. So, on to the pros and cons then. Um, in terms of the detail and both visual and in fact the system detail that they've put in place as well apart from the baggage loader not actually knowing where the hold is, interesting um, but <laughs> overall very good detail on all that and, and I think it's a very pretty little aircraft it's fun to fly it is a good, oh now okay fine it's a teleporting belt loader um, it's a great aircraft to fly, keep practicing with, doing things manually um, and for that reason, I really think that 14, 49 uh, in pounds is a pretty good price for it. Um, you get a good choice of all the models that are available. You know, they've covered all bases. They're not selling every little variant separately like some people we know. Um, and the liveries that go with it are uh, excellent. Lots of selection. And thanks to the community, we've got even more third-party liveries available if we want them. The sound model is great. 
um, I hope you've heard some of the flap extension sounds in the in the cabin as well as you know outside and all the extra sounds that we've got and the voice act, the voice um, voices rather from from the crew it's it's just brilliant um, and the fact that it's all you know not just it's this location based as well is shows that there's a lot of detail have gone has gone into it onto the side that I'm a bit disappointed by perhaps if I've got my uh, research correct the FMS could be a little bit more true to this aircraft um, it's a shame again that the weather radar doesn't work um, but we're seeing that across the board with my Microsoft Flight Simulator add-ons and I think it's starting to reflect badly on Microsoft to be honest with you um, EFB is pretty good but it's a little bit clunky on the aircraft setting side of things um, and the logic on the elevator not 100% sure about that with the servo tabs that it uses um, so we've still got a bit of pressure so actually that's quite good and potentially it'll stop working when it's not but I shouldn't be able to move the whole elevator uh, with my controls there and lastly the circuit breakers aren't clickable but I don't think they're trying to be a study level um, add-on you know they're very detailed but you know the circuit breakers is that a deal breaker for you? I, I don't really think it is for me um, and again the weather radar will hopefully be fixed in a future update anyway I think it's certainly on their roadmap Well, I do hope you've enjoyed the video today. Thanks again for joining us. Please do remember uh, to like and subscribe to our channel. And also, uh, by all means, come and join us on our Discord. Uh, all the details are uh, in the description below or on our uh, YouTube page itself. And uh, thanks again for watching, and please do take care.